I love to go to waste I want you and your beautiful soul I know that you are something special And to you I'd be always faithful And I want to be what you always needed And then I hope you'll see the heart in me I don't want another pretty face I don't want just anyone to fool I don't want my love to go to waste I want you and your beautiful soul You're the one I want to chase You're the one I want to hold I won't let another minute go to waste Things right between us mm -hmm. Now it's 
Hello guys, welcome back to uh, our cyber security lecture. So today, uh, this is week three, just in case you have lost count already. So this is, uh, I have a new mic here. Let me know if it is too noisy. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether you hear me or you hear the noise. It cannot hear. Oh, I think it's lagging. Maybe the audio is not sync. Okay, I changed the mic. But how is the sound quality? Is it better than before? If not, I want to refund this mic. 
Wait, uh, let me see how I set this thing. Never mind, just change back the old mic. <clears throat> I keep this one for my karaoke session tonight. Okay, so your your assignment has already <laughs> you decided, okay? Uh so you can find your assignment uh questions after this class, so maybe around uh before five, I'll upload your assignment. I just want to make sure that you do an assignment that you actually like it and then you can also do it, okay? So assignment is uh, mostly the things that we have learned from the class together with about 20% of new thing. And the new thing also got answer given to you. I'll give you a, a list of playlists, uh, some short videos that you can watch to solve your assignment, okay? So I won't spend time to explain assignment here. We go straight into our lecture class. Okay, so today we'll be doing two things. Uh, first one, the first part, I will continue with malware analysis, our chapter three. So uh, we have explained the theoretical part of chapter three. Today we will continue with the try hack me on for chapter three on malware analysis. Now uh, for this part, I will be showing you uh, some very common tricks that attacker use to hide virus. We will also learn how to analyze your virus file uh, and this part is really cool, okay? It's kind of like treasure hunt if you're into those kind of thing and in fact, actually I saw one of the guy here already like scored 20, 200 points Luna Legion Who is this guy? Can I be your friend? Ah? Show yourself, please show yourself If you are shy, then you DM me because this guy is next level Another guy is COVID-19 COVID-19 is also so pro, but your name scare me like I don't want to be your friend. So Luna Legion, please show yourself to me. And then, yeah, now I, I will show you how we solve all this challenge today. And today we will be using only Windows machine. So this is a day where we finally find our Windows machine to be useful, okay? Uh, totally fully on Windows. We do not need Kali Linux for this class. All right, and for the second part, uh, I will be showing you net. We will be we will be going into chapter four, which is on network security. Now that that chapter is a lot of theory. Okay, so in chapter four, there is no try hack me box, which is some people is yeah yeah. If you don't like all this kind of hands on, then uh, chapter four is for you because it's a lot of theory that you need to learn. And finally, we will finish off with chapter five, uh, which is on exploiting network services okay so this is kind of the plan that we have uh, for this week now i uh, just want to also briefly tell you about our plan going forward okay this can so i have three news uh, okay i have three news for you i have one good news i have one better news i have and then i have one best news so let's start with the good news first good news is uh on next week week four right yeah week four um you'll be having one lab test. Okay, so the lab test is very similar to the things that you learn from your lab 1 and lab 2 and lab 3, okay, until lab 3. And also all the things that we have been doing on try hack week. Okay, so that is for week 4. The, the lab test will happen in our lecture hour. So you don't have to wake up early or stay up late for the uh, test. It will be on the lecture hour. And yeah. That is a good news right now and then the better news is next week uh actually I, I will only teach you until week three okay starting from week four uh i won't be teaching the lecture because uh dr gun will actually take over the lecture class from week four week five and week six okay so yeah that is actually the better news so dr gun is a security expert 
I think some of you might already know him. He's also a networking expert. So he's kind of like my boss, all right? Like whatever I know how to do, he also know how to do. But whatever he know how to do, I do not know how to do. So he's my boss and he'll be uh, doing the lecture with you from week four, week five and week six, all right? And yeah, so for that one, uh, for week four onwards, you'll use Microsoft Team. We won't be streaming on YouTube anymore. So actually this is the last week we'll be streaming uh, cybersecurity class on YouTube and don't worry, don't worry, I'll come back again at week 6 uh, and then I'll do a revision class with you, okay? Because as you know, any one of you here who took Datacom know that it, the revision class is the most important class. If you only attend one class, you have to attend that revision class. So week 6, I uh, will still be streaming the last one on uh, the cybersecurity stream here on YouTube. So yeah, that's kind of our plan here, but actually, hey, don't say something like that. Dr. Gan is my best friend and he's a pro. So uh, don't worry, he is going to teach you about the, a few things. So he will cover for the cybersecurity law, forensics and blockchain, okay? which is something that only he knows, I do not know. All right, so that is our plan. So also the best news, right? I say that is the best news. So the best news is on week four, uh, there is actually, oh yeah, there's one lecture from Dr. Gan. Then I think yeah, week five you will have a talk. Okay. So week five you have a talk from an expert. So we actually managed to get Hirti and they will send their security expert to tell you more about cybersecurity. So so far what you have here is from me. Okay. But you see, I'm just a lecturer. If you really want to be a hacker, you should learn from a people from the industry and from a real hacker. Lah. So uh, yeah, Big Five will schedule a talk for you. That one is compulsory. So that will, that's going to be just like a lecture class and you'll be given attendance, all right? So that's the best news. Now, that, why is best news? Because just sit and listen, no need to do try hack me. Okay, so that's the three news that I want to tell you. Can I hack into Meta and change it back to Facebook? Yeah, later in fact, I want to show you how Meta get its logo. I found it. All right, so yeah, we're going to continue with uh, one 45 minute we do this thing. Now this one here, I hope that you can do this with me lah, because uh, it's a really fun challenge. If you somehow can solve most of this thing on your own, I tell you, uh, your future is brighter than the OLED display with 100 nit. Okay, because uh, that means you are really tempted in cybersecurity, especially in malware analysis. All right, so we'll start with uh, the task two. Okay, now before that, uh, I think all of you already by now should already attend your lab two. So uh, I get a few questions from some of students who are trying out all the challenges. So there are some, I, I don't know why no people ask me. Uh, so they ask me like, how do I start the attack box, all these things. Okay, now for now, you do not have to start any attack box yet. I will show you uh, on Wednesday night how to start two box in one PC, okay? Now, in fact, if you want, I can show you now. Lah. I can show you now. So, for the student who want to uh, use the SSH server that I give to you, so if you notice, uh, there is an SSH server here on Weber. Okay, so some of you might just download and then don't even care because uh, you do not know what this is for. So, this SSH server is actually the server that I used the other day to show you that I can log into the SSH using either password or the private key file, right? Okay, now, if you want to do this on your site, it is also possible. Uh, the way you start two box, uh, this box is that, okay, the idea is like this. You have attacker and you have the defender. So the attacker here is actually your Kali Linux box all right now and then the victim we say the victim okay of course when you want to attack people you need to know who is the target now this this SSH server when you download it is called network services OVA. so both of these also uh, is actually uh, an OVA file so what you do is you need to open two machine one is for you to attack one is for you to be attacked. So this is the victim. Do you get what I mean here? So uh, actually, 
in the real world, of course, this will be two different PC la, But right now, because uh, you don't have so many PC, you can just run the attacker and the victim in one machine, which is your own laptop or your own PC right now. And now, of course, if your PC is not very fast or don't have enough RAM, then it's going to be struggle a little bit. But yeah, this is the idea here. In one PC, you open two virtual box. One is to use to attack. One is uh, the machines that you want to attack into. All right. So uh, anyway, you still have to do this because your assignment will require you to do something like this. So for example here, I have uh, a few virtual box. So you can you notice that you can have many uh, versions of Kali running. There's no problem here. And you can also run many, many box at the same time. So you don't even need to buy Windows or anything or Mac OS. Just use Kali, uh, use Linux because Linux is free. Then go and download the Windows 11 virtual box. Right or not? It's free. Okay, now the idea is you want to open your Kali Linux. So this is my Kali Linux. All right, you can use the one that has customized for you. And then this is the victim. So one attacker, one victim. Now what you do is you will have to start them, start this one and also start this one. So start two machines. I hope your machines can take it. And then yeah, you see now I have two virtual box running. On the left is the Kali Linux. On the right is the server. This is the server that I create for you so that you can learn cyber security. There are many misconfigurations and loophole and vulnerabilities that I put in the server where you can use to learn and try out some exercises. Okay, So yeah, this is the two machines here. So the idea here is that you use the one on the left side, which is your Kali, to attack to the one on the right side. Okay, now of course, uh, then you might have questions like, okay, wait, if I want to hack people, of course, I need to know the target IP address, right? So for example, now I inside my Kali on the left and uh, on the right, you cannot see anything because this is a server. So server normally, there is no uh, user interface. So it's just something like this. Okay, now normally, when you want to attack the, this victim on the right side, you need to know this victim IP address. Now in this case, how do I know what is the IP address? Okay, I give you a shortcut. Okay, this is this is actually cheating, but I I just tell you lah. You can log into this uh, server using the username. Actually, I already give to you if you know. Okay, username is Tay Tay. The password is R O eight nine zero six two five. Okay, so this is the credential for this box. If you want to log in, uh, directly. Okay, the reason is because you want to get the IP address for this box so that you can attack over. Now for example, I log in here, Tay Tay, and then I put in the password. See now I'm in, right? So again, it's all uh, only Unicode. There is no uh, graphical user interface here. Okay, now uh, what you can do is you do an IF config and then you want to find out what is your IP address. So in this case, uh, you can see it's 192.168.233.54. Okay, now, once you have the victim IP, you cannot attack from here. So attack from this side to this side. Okay. Now of course the first thing is you must be able to ping first. Now if you cannot ping, then nothing will work. So if you can ping, means that the attacker already found the victim. So from here onwards, what can you do? What can you do? You can do so many things like uh, send him a malicious file, uh, ping until he crash. So many things that eventually we will learn. But this one is just a brief head up for those who want to try to start up the server on your own. Okay, now one extra thing for you is that actually in the real world, uh, the victim is not, not going to call you up and then tell, you, tell the attacker, hey, my IP is 192.168.223.54, come and hack me, try hack me. No, it's not going to work like that. So as an attacker, in fact, you need to be able to know what is the victim IP and in this Wednesday, I'm going to show you how you can use nmap and try to get the I okay, so try to get all the IP address of the victim. All right, so that is actually what you do, and this is what you need to do for your assignment. Okay, I'll go into more details on this uh, coming Wednesday. 
to show you that how you can actually use Kali to find out what is the victim IP address. So right now what I'm doing is I'm scanning the whole network here and this is actually some IP address of other lecturers because now we already come back to the office so quite a number of lecturers are here and then one of the IP will be the, the server IP. Okay, You have to keep scanning until later you find the server IP. Oh, it looks like so many people is back already. Okay, but this I, I will show you how you actually do this uh, on Wednesday. Alright, so this is just a head up. Okay, then I want to give you another head up on the Linux file permission. Okay, so by now you should already finish your lab tool. So I think most of you here will already be very familiar about Linux how you create file, how you delete file, how you make new folder, how you change the permission of the file. Am I correct? So, uh, let me know if I'm not correct, okay? Anyone here is still not familiar with how to use Linux? You should be quite good by now, okay? Now, uh, if you notice, uh, I don't cover the file permission on the lecture class, okay? Uh, that's because I don't want to spend too much time to explain the file permissions. The whole point of file permissions on Linux is so that you want to grant access to the right user. For example, certain file can only be run by the root user, which is uh, the most powerful user on Linux. Something similar to the administrator on your Windows machine. And you want some uh, people in different group to be able to read, write, or access, execute. All right? so, uh, for you to learn more about the file permissions, please refer to your lab tool. But right now, I will teach you a shortcut uh, on that what I normally do to change file permission. This is very important because without this, you cannot do your assignment. Okay, you need to be able to know how to change file permissions to solve the assignment. All right. Now I won't talk about the details because I want to make this very easy for you. Okay, let's say. I have a file called Mobile Legend. Right? This is a file called Mobile Legend. Okay, I'll give you a few scenarios first, but if you already have a better way, you don't have to follow my way. Okay, so what you see here is uh, something that is very similar to your lab tool and this is what we call Linux file permission. So, hey, why got so many cursor here? I think this is the part. Right now, uh, you have seen, uh, we actually specify using something like this. Okay, so if you do an ls, in Linux ls is used to list file. Then you use the dash l options. Now here, this is where you see all the different file permissions. All right. Now, if you use ls-la, this one will show you more things. This one show you all the hidden files. So sometimes, you know, we like to hide things from other people. And how you see all the hidden files is by using the dash a options. All right. So if I do a ls-l here, in this example, I saw that there's one file, mobile legend of apk. So this is an installer for mobile legend. And right now, this is the file permission. So you see here, this is how Linux specify file permissions. Okay, now, which is something similar to this. Okay, now the first bit here is to specify whether this is a file or this is a directory. So in Linux, we don't call this a folder. On Windows, we say files and folder. On Linux, we say uh, directory and files. Okay, so the folder and directory are the same thing. Now, if this is a file, like an exe file or a text file or a pdf file, then you will see a dash here. This one is a dash. Alright, if you see a directory, then you'll see a D here. The first bit is to represent whether it's a, a file or a directory. So something like this. If I make a directory here, 
new folder. All right, so as you can see now, the new folder here, this as we know is a directory, so the first bit will be a D to tell us that this is a directory. All right, then this one is a dash to tell us that this is just a file, not a directory. Okay, now then I go to the second part. We have three parts here, which is to specify user, group, and other. Now, why we have this is because uh, Linux, we classify user into three categories. Either you yourself, the owner, so we call this the user, and the group. Group is like a working group. Okay, for example, now if all of us connect to the same Wi-Fi network, then we might belong to the same group. Okay, so this is called a working group. For example, FICT lecturer will be in one group, FBF lecturer will be in another group. Okay, now other, other means uh, other user, which is not part of your group. Okay, yeah. Why is people smiling on the chat? All right, so uh, all here we have three bits to represent read, write, access. So you can only choose whether to read, write, or ex execute. Okay, now uh. As you can guess, like, read means that you can only open the file, but you cannot change the file. So you can only open and view, cannot modify. All right. Then you have write. Write means that you can open, read, and modify the content. And then the last one is execute. Execute means you can open, read, modify, and even to run the program. So you have three uh, different actions, read, write, and execute. Okay, so we represent this using uh, R, W, and X. Okay, this one is R, this one is W, this one is X. So for example here, I might have R, W, X. So means user can read, user can write, user can execute. Okay, now if I have something like this, it means that user can read, user cannot write, user cannot execute. Okay, it's the same thing for group. Also R, W, X. Okay, only three bits. So this means anyone in the group can read, write, and execute. Okay, now if I have something like this, it means that anyone in the group can read, cannot write, but can execute. Okay, I'm going very fast because you should already learn from the lab. So same thing for the other. I have these three bits, read, write, execute as well. Okay. So now, uh, if I have something like this, means that other people cannot read, cannot write, and cannot execute. Okay, if I have R and then two dash means, and any other people can read but cannot write and cannot execute. All right, so it's as simple as this. So if you see the bits, it says, uh, you have bits set to one. That means can read, write, and access. Okay, now in the lab you learn how to calculate the binary. And then if you remember, you have a command that looks something like this, ch mode uh, 700 and then a file name, right? Okay, this is what you learned in our ch mode 400 file name.txt to change the permissions. All right, now I have a better way for you. For those who don't want to calculate binary or don't want to remember anything, you can follow the way I do it. So let's say I have one example here. Okay, if I want to set the user to be able to write, read, write, execute. So I want this to be read, write, and execute. Okay, now I do this using my example here. Right now, you see uh, the mobile legend permission. So now is this one, the first bit means this is a file, correct? Then I have r dash dash means that I, I write here first. Uh, Okay, so it means right now this file, the user can read the file but cannot write, cannot execute, so cannot install. The group, same group, cannot do anything. Other people also cannot do anything. Cannot read, cannot write, cannot execute. Okay, so this one is the lowest kind of permissions that you can assign. Only the right user, the owner, can read the file. So let's say I want to change the permissions now. So I want to set in a way that the user now can read, write, execute. So I want to change this to W and X. Alright, now on the left, you will learn how to calculate this is 1, 1, 1, right? Okay, now the way I show you here is no calculation one. Now. So for example, now 
I want read write execute. So what I do is I can just use a command ch mode. Okay, I write u. So this u represent user. This user here is u. Okay, then I just write the command plus. Means I want to add the permissions. Okay, so what I want now, I want to add two more things. One is read, one is write, one is execute. So now it's already can read. I want to add write and execute, right? So I will just write R for read. Oh, sorry, R for write, X for execute. Alright, so you see, I can do something like this here on my Kali CH mode user plus two permissions, okay? Write permissions and execute permissions. And I want to apply this to mobile legend.apk. Now, if you check the file permission now, you should be able to see now the user can read, write, execute. So what I have just done is I'm just adding two permissions so that now I can write execute. So I don't want to calculate what is CH mode 700 or CH mode 400 or CH mode 600, okay? I, because I just hit max, right? Okay, so yeah, same thing here. You can also, uh, let's say another example. I want to set user can read, write, execute. So we have already done this. And the group can also read and write. So now we want to add two here. This one I want to read. I want to write for the group, but execute cannot. Okay, so same thing here. I will just use the ch mode command. And this time I use a g. g represent this group. This group here, g. Alright, I want to add permission, so I plus use the plus sign. So what do I want to add? Read and write permissions, right? So here I just put read and write. Okay, so uh, yeah, let me try and see whether this works. I hope it is like this, lah. read and write mobile legend. So let's apply this to mobile legend. Yeah, okay. And then you try to do ls-l, you can see now, for the second part here, the anyone in the same group can now read and write the same file. Okay, so I think you kind of get the idea, right? So another example, the last example here. Let's say I want to set everyone to get all the permissions. So now it will be like user can read write access, group can read write access, or oh, I mean execute, not access, sorry. Uh, bad habit. So other can also read write execute. Okay, so I want like full permissions uh, for everyone. Now of course you can just do this because you know 700 is going to give you full permissions. Or you can just use ch mode and then you add permissions manually. Now, if you want to add permissions manually, for example, O, uh, I can just do something like O plus R W X. This will work. Okay. Now, you can also combine the front part. For example, now I want to set for everyone. So I just U for user, G for group, O for other, plus R W X. Read, write, execute. I can also do this to give full permissions to all the files. So for example, here, I can do ch mode, user, group, other, plus, read, write, execute. Okay. Why he don't allow me to do this? Oh, something is wrong. Oh, I forget to put the file name. Sorry, sorry. Not enough coffee. Should work. Okay, let me clear screen. I don't want you to get confused. So ch mode, user, group, other, plus, rwx, and then mobile legend. Yeah, you see this work. So now I do ls-l, you are going to see now this file will have all the permissions for everyone to do anything on that file. Okay, so why I'm showing you this is because normally I don't want to uh, try to calculate if I want this cannot write, this can write, that cannot execute, what is the number? It's a bit troublesome. So normally uh, if you want it to be faster, you should just say, okay, now uh, you want to take away all permissions, right? I can also do ch mode 400. Now this will work. If you like, see I take away all permissions. If I want to assign all permissions, I can also do something like this. Then you see now, all, okay. all 700 is only for this one. So 777 will give you all full permissions. So let's say you want to give full permission, you can do something like this. Then now you will notice that the file has full permissions now, which is uh, what you have learned in the lab. 
But like I say, normally it's not always like that because uh, uh, there are certain things where you want to set user can read, cannot write, cannot execute, or sometimes can read, can write, but cannot execute. It's a bit troublesome. So that's why I show you this way. Lah. Okay, so you see, uh, if I want to set just one bit, for example, user can execute but cannot write, which is a bit weird, but let's try this. So ch mode, user can execute mobile legend. See, I only set the X, so I don't need to calculate anymore. It's quite easy in this way. Alright? Okay, so question time. What if I add one more time, will it be off or just remain? Yeah, don't really get what you mean here. Can we change the order like G plus W? Ah, yeah, no problem. Windy, you're right. This command here, you can do CH mode G U O plus X W R O A. Oh yeah, wait now. Nah. Also, it will work. So there is no uh, any precedence. You just have to remember, U is for user, G is for the group, X is for sorry, O is for the other. All right. So it's very simple. What if you want to cancel some permissions? Uh, actually, the way I recommend is just do CH mode four hundred and then start over because this is the easiest way and faster. If you try to manually take away one at a time, also can, uh, but using this syntax also can, but then it will take you even more time. Okay, so the reason I'm showing you this is I want you to be faster than average people. But to set back the all basic permissions better, you use CH mode 400. This one is the fastest way. Okay. Uh, cute. Okay, so can the group be split to multiple group again? Uh, actually here, the, if you use this kind of syntax, you can only set for the whole group. But if you want to specify which group, like group user group and then admin group, uh, this command cannot do that. Okay, So yeah, uh, that is how you set and change file permissions on Linux. Now we go back to our try hack me. This is important for your assignment. Huh? So let's go to the fun part. I say this 40 minutes ago. We still haven't go to the fun part yet. Alright, now let's talk about malware analysis. The, the syntax is not case sensitive. Okay, so uh, can be caps or without caps. Also, it will work. Alright, uh, now let's come back to this. Why the time is so fast one? We already done task one. So in previously on cybersecurity lecture, I explained how is a uh, virus different from a Trojan, from a worm, and from ransomware. So by now, I expect everyone already can differentiate between different kind of malware, and we go straight into task two. So when we try to analyze for uh, any malware, for example, I'm suspecting that this file might be infected with virus. Okay, so there are actually two ways and two general approach to, to do this kind of malware analysis. As you can see here, there is a static analysis and a dynamic analysis. Right? So static analysis is you analyze a malware binary without running the code. So you don't run the program. Okay? Mal dynamic analysis is you will run the malware sample and observe the behavior on the system. So this is a very clear cut case. I have a file that I think might be infected. Okay, my first natural instinct is actually uh, normal people will just double click. Okay, now uh, that that's actually not wrong. In fact, it's uh, the most popular way to analyze way to analyze virus because uh, let's say if you have a file that you think could be infected, um, you want to know whether what it does, like whether this virus delete a file from a machine or whether this virus just print a hello world message, so not a harmful virus, just run the virus. Yeah, in fact, that's the best way. If you run the virus and your PC auto shut down, then uh, we are very sure that there is a virus, but then your PC will be infected. So that is why people do static analysis uh, in the first place, because this is the safest way. Now, if the file is really infected, if I don't run the file, the virus cannot execute itself. 
All right, so this is why uh, we will only see the code and then we try to study the code because we are programmers. We understand the programming logic. So when I read the code, read, read, it, suddenly this line looks like a virus. Then that is how we know whether this file in, is infected or not. All right, now uh, static analysis is actually very hard. I, I can hear it's very hard. Uh, you need to know of many things. Now, for example, why why do I say cyber security is a very hard subject? In fact, if you ask me, I think this is actually a hard subject. Now, if you learn data com, you only need to know about computer networking, right? All the IP address, MAC address, and dynamic routing, static routing. Now, if you learn programming, you only need to know, be good in the language. Like if you're doing C++, you only need to know how to write a C language. In C language, if you're using Python, it's way easier. You only need to know the, the nomenclature and the, the working of the language, right? But when you do cybersecurity, you need to know computer networking. You need to also know programming so that you can analyze malware. You also need to know how to do SQL database so that you can do SQL injection. You also need to know how to write a website, how to code a website, web scripting, so that you can uh, do cross-site injections. So cybersecurity is actually uh, the hardest thing that you can learn. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk, come back to static analysis. Now, why I'm saying this is because for you to analyze a file to see whether this is infected or not, first thing is you need to understand the programming language for this program. Okay. If you do not know programming, you cannot do this. So, uh, I will now explain more about static first and then I show you dynamic. Okay? Now you understand the static and dynamic, the difference. Okay, now we understand. So we go to task three now. My question for you is which do you think is better? Okay, if I give you a file, okay, so you think anything that I will give to you might not be so good. Don't open anything that I give to you. Okay? Now of course I I just want to make this clear in the class, huh? I never add any malware in anything that I share to you. Because if I infect you, your PC auto shut down, then I get less view for this video. So it's, I have nothing to gain. So I'm not adding any malware. Don't worry. You have to trust me. Okay. But uh, some of the files here that you download today will contain virus. I have to be honest here. In fact, if you try to download now, your computer might not allow you to do so. So for us to do all the challenge today, first thing I need you to do is to turn off your antivirus on the PC. Okay, can you trust me or not? Can we trust each other? Don't worry, the virus file that you download later is not a harmful virus, it's just a fake virus for educational purpose. Okay, but I need you to turn off your firewall and your antivirus. Can we trust each other? Do you trust me? Okay. Come on, do this together. After you learn this, then that is how you know why sometimes my PC is slow. Sometimes it's suddenly wake up in the middle of the night, the fan starts spinning, but I didn't do anything, especially on Halloween. So we want to understand all these things together, okay? Now I show you how you turn off, but first I need you to download the task file. Okay, uh, let me explain now. Uh. Here in task 2, you can also download the task file. This one is for all the tasks. I zip everything into one. So if you download the, the thing from task 2, you don't have to download from all other individual tasks anymore. Everything is all in one here. Okay. But of course, when you download, Google Chrome will delete it because there is a virus inside here. So what I need you to do is you go to setting now. Okay. This is the setting. Go to security. Okay. Go setting security i'm expecting you're running on windows right if you're not using windows you cannot do this uh, challenge okay then you go to windows security setting this one here okay now virus and threat protections click inside i need you to turn off so you see uh, here you need to turn off everything you click on the manage setting here make sure here is off everything is off then only you can download the zip file Otherwise, you cannot download the zip file. Okay, so uh, if you if I'm too fast, you can come back and replay the video later on how to turn off all this virus and threat protection. Okay, turn off everything. Let it be naked. 
and let the virus attack you. <clears throat> that is how you learn. You let virus attack, then only you learn how virus attack. Okay, so uh, yeah, assuming that you already done this, you should be able to download the file and it will look something like this. Okay, this is what you should have. Yeah, this thing. So in the folder, there are so many tasks and all the tasks is already uh, properly packed for you. Alright, so I need you to do this first. Don't worry, it's not a real virus. I told you it's for educational purpose. Okay, if you cannot trust me, then from here onwards, you just watch this Korean drama without subtitle. Turn off all your antivirus. Okay, now, I assume you already done this. Then let's try task 3. Okay, now in task 3, I want to show you which kind of malware analysis is better. Okay, now, uh, in our lecture, we I'm going to explain how static, how to do static analysis and then how we do dynamic. And then we'll stop here. And we will go to other kind of area like how to hide virus. Okay, so we will not go too deep into how antivirus detect virus, how intrusion detection system detect uh, intrusions. Because those things are already automated, so there's really no point for us to spend time to talk about those things. Okay, now, static analysis here is more effective against a malware with fixed signature. Okay, a dynamic analysis is more effective against a complex virus. Okay, now, like what I said earlier, static analysis means you don't run the program. You just read the code and then you try to see whether this is a virus or not. Dynamic analysis means that you run the program. If the program actually did something harmful, then that's how you know this is a virus. Okay? Of course, when we do this, you cannot just double click and run on the machines. Then what if it is really a virus? How? You are going to blame me and my view will become from 400 become 100. The 100 is those guys who never click on the file because they are still sleeping. Okay, so they are safe. Now, which is why when we do a dynamic analysis, we have this thing called a sandbox seed. Alright, now if you click on this link here, this will bring you, you will download this installer. I need you to install this on your PC later, not now. And don't worry, this is not a virus. This is a sandbox. Now this thing, is very similar to the virtual box that we are using right now. So what this does is that you want to run a dynamic analysis in a sandbox environment. Do you read this line? So it means that we are going to create a clone of our PC and then we try to run the virus inside the clone instead of running the virus in our real PC that we are using right now. Okay, so the idea is Anything that happened inside a sandbox stays within the sandbox. So for example, let's say I run a program, which is a virus, and then it delete all my files. Now when this happened, it only the, the harm, the damage is only contained within the virtual box, not the real OS. Alright, so this is what I mean here. Now in task 3, after you download, you will get an exe file. Alright, now be honest. How many of you already double click on this file? <laughs> how many of you? Okay, in security, you are not supposed to do that because this could be a virus, especially the exe file that you get from your cyber security lecturer. Most of the time, it is a virus. Okay, so now if you have already double click, don't worry, lah. It's not a, nothing harmful is going to happen. Just a program that looks like that. Ask you to enter your username and password. Okay, now of course after I click this, look at this. Everything is still working. Okay. Uh, Chrome can still open, everything is okay. So I think this is fine. Luckily that this is not doing anything bad to my PC, all right? I don't see any crashing or slowdown or anything. So in fact, this is not a virus. Now, but the right way to do this is you have to open Sandboxy. So after you install the program, you will see something at the bottom right of your taskbar. So this is a Sandboxy control. Can you see this? All right. Now, you right click here and then you go to default box 
then you use run window explorer okay now after that you will notice a new window appear this window here you see that is one circle yellow color outline one so this represents a sandbox means that this is a, a virtual environment that is very similar to your real pc so you see here in fact i have an exact same copy all right so you see yeah this is my pc now here on the left side this is the real one on the right side here with the one yellow and you see here got hashtag one hashtag pc this is the fake one okay now the idea is we want to do everything here for a dynamic analysis so that let's say it happened that halfway in the analysis the virus attacked me before i can clean it then all the damage is done here but not on your real pc here okay so this is sandbox you see exactly same copy one you know so just now i downloaded uh, the task file to desktop so on left side this is the real one i can go to chapter 3 task 3 i can see this one but we don't want to run here just in case it is actually a virus so you want to go to your sandbox exactly the same place task 3 and then you run in a sandbox now you see any program that I run on the sandbox also have a yellow circle outside, yellow outline. So it means that this is running on a virtual environment. If anything bad goes wrong, it is not going to damage your real system. Okay, so I am not scared of you anymore because you cannot attack my real machines. Okay, now you see if I run using a real command prompt on the real OS, this is how it's different. First, there is no hashtag, see? Hashtag means got uh, this is a sandbox. This one is the real one. Alright. Now um I can also show you some example like let's say here this is the sandbox, right? So for example, the virus can delete your file. After you run, he delete this file. So this one is deleted. Gone, no more. All your girlfriend picture gone just like that in one second. Two years of sweet memory gone. So here, no more. But you see, on the real PC, this one is still here. Don't worry, because anything that happened in the sandbox stay within the sandbox. Even the virus crash the whole system cannot start anymore. Don't worry, because the real system will not be affected. Okay, so this is the concept of sandbox, and that is how you should uh, do any malware analysis, I mean that dynamic analysis here going forward. Alright, so I uh, can show again how to run the sandbox C. Okay, I close this one first, and this is how I run sandbox. So, of course, first thing is you need to make sure you have sandbox C installed on the machines. Now, on the bottom right corner, you will see a yellow color, looks like a pizza, but it's an odd shaped pizza, it's a square one. Right click, then here you see there's a default box. You choose Run Window Explorer. Okay. and then this is going to give you a new replicate replica of your windows pc okay this is how i start the sandbox okay now then we go to static analysis i think today we solve this also not enough time yeah never mind like we just do this then tomorrow i mean wednesday only we do the network okay now static analysis Okay, now this one is for the people who, I mean, know about programming and you don't want to run the program. Actually, if you ask me, I say there's no harm. Just run the program because Sandbox C is not going, it's going to protect you from any damage. Okay, but certain times you can just read the source code. Now, it sounds a bit weird because you see, what I have here is an exe file. I don't have a source code. So how can I analyze the code of this program? Okay, so here, let's go back to uh, another concept called the compilations. Okay, now, uh, I'm sure you have already took C++, right? So you should be familiar about how to write a program, how to compile a program. So this is how it looks like. 
uh, every time when we write any program, you need a few things. Of course, you need an IDE, like your Eclipse, if you're coding in Java, or if you're writing in C++, it is Visual Studio. If you're writing on Python language, then it is Anaconda. Now, you have IDE. We call this a compiler also. Like. That means you write your code inside. After that, you click compile. And that this one here, uh, it will now be translated. So, for example, I write a C code, okay? hello world.cpp. Then I click compile. Okay, now it will be compiled into an exe or maybe a .jar, depending on what kind of extension you want it to be, like, or what language you're using. So now this this program here is what we give to the end user. For example, if you want to install a program like sandboxing.exe, all right, or mobilelegend.apk, so it's already packed. But we all know that this program in fact comes from a source code that some programmer has written. Okay, now that is what you learn in programming. Over here, I want you to know that you can actually do the other way around. This is called reverse engineering and given a program, you can find back what is the source code. So we call this a decompilation. Now, how this, is this even possible? If this concept is true, think about this, what can you do? You can actually now go to App Store and download any program, any APK, you can decompile and see the source code. This is actually uh, happening. This is real. Uh, and even like, for example, you have a programming assignment, okay? And then you see your friend already submitted this one. Of course, your friend will not give you the source code, lah, okay? But actually, you can use this thing, a decompilation to get back the source code. So in a way, it is kind of like stealing people's source code. This is true. And you can do this on most programs that you find online, or in fact, any program. And we call this uh, a program tag. means that you can steal people's source code. Okay, now, uh, the problem is that it's not always that easy. Okay, what I say here is just uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it might not work. But this is actually cool. I want you to know that this is actually possible. Given a program, you can see the source code. Okay, now uh, what do you do is you need to use a program, a decompiler, like this thing, IDA or Ghidra. Now these two are a very popular decompiler where if you give him any uh, program that has been packed, it can tell you what is the source code. Now, in fact, let me show you how these things look like. But again, this is just a demo, so you do not have to do this on your site. Okay? Okay, now, uh, one popular uh, decompilation tool is called Ghidra. Now again, uh, this is just a demo to show you what, how much power people have okay, using this program, but you do not have to do this on your site. So look at this. This logo looks like the new Facebook logo, Meta. This morning, I really finally found out maybe Mark Zuckerberg stole the logo from here, changed it to blue color. All right. Now, uh, so for example, I have a program. Okay, this is a string program. .exe, very simple program. I can use a decompiler to get back the source code. So this is how it looks like. I have to load a bit uh, because now he read the program. Uh. So uh, just spin for a while. See, this is a code browser. Okay, and if you are familiar with programming, you know that you have. Uh, functions and all these things. So in fact, Ghidra is so good that he will automatically detect this program is C++ program or is a Python program or a Java program that automatically it analyzes for you. So uh, you do not have to know the workings of this thing. I'm just trying to show you what it can do. For example, now uh, I have a program exe file. I can go to the extent like I think it hang already. Yeah, so this is kind of the assembly language in the middle. And on the right, this is where you see the original source code. Okay, let me see whether I can. Yeah, okay, it's still decompiling. It's going to take a while. Whew, yeah. You are right, you are right. This is developed by NSA. So imagine what they know about you. 
Why is this card so slow? I have 64 gig of RAM here on this machine, but it's still lagging. Okay, have to be patient. Patient is the key to be a good hacker. Hello. Why so slow? Cannot even show you the source code. I think this is dead. I lost the Kali. Never mind, we just leave it here. Maybe he will come back. If I can show you, then later I show you that you can see the source code. So yeah, this is the compilation. Okay. Now in our syllabus, uh, you don't have to run Ghidra or IDA. You just need to use the string command. Okay, string command is very similar but not that pro. So we're gonna do something similar. I give you an ESE file, and then I want you to print out the content of the EXE file. So over here, this is uh, the program that we have. Okay, now I will open a command prompt. On my Windows PC now, I open a command prompt. Okay, so I will use the string program to print the content of this thing. Now, of course, if I open a notepad, do you think it is possible? Uh, I open notepad and then I throw this program inside to see what is the content. You, 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 you will see some alien language that nobody is going to understand. Okay, This is quite common because ESE file is all the binaries that the compiler has packed your source code from. So you don't really see anything. Okay, But you can use this string to print out. Now of course, if you are good with Windows scripting, you can just cd to uh, all the necessary directory. But on this stream, I'll show you some even simpler example, just drag and drop. So I don't need you to type the full path. Okay, this is how I do it. First, you need this program called the string program. Okay, the string program will print out the content of a file. Okay, now for example, I want to use this program. What I do now is I just drag this whole thing into my command prompt. This is programming life hack. You don't have to type the full path, then you see automatically the command prompt show you the full path to this program. Okay, now you see if I take one text file and drag inside here, what it do is this program will now print up all the file inside, all the text inside this file. So you see if I open it in the back, this is exactly the same thing. See, so a string uh, command is used to print out the content of a file, which is what you are seeing on the screen now. I just print out a content of a text file, and they are exactly the same thing, right? So it's very similar to the cat command you have on Linux. And now we want to go one step further. So I will now use this program to show me what is the content of this exe file. Okay, so now this is how I do it. Again, I will have to drag this program to the command prompt first. Okay, space bar, and then I go back to this directory, and now I just drag this whole program inside here. Okay, now, of course, you can just press enter, and then it's going to show you all the source code of this program. Alright, but this is very hard to read. So normally, you want to write this to a text file. For example, I have an output file here. Okay. Why not we just write this to this file so that later it's easier for us to read. Or and we can also search for some things that we want. Okay, So now, uh, the output file is already here. I created this for you, but it's empty. What you need to do is, okay, repeat the whole thing. Use this program string, drag inside your command prompt, spacebar. I want to print the content of this exe file. Okay, and then I write it to the output file. So I use this operator pipe to pipe to this output. Press enter. Okay. Now in a while you will see now this output file got all the content already. So this is how I print to a text file instead of printing on the uh, prompt because prompt is very hard to read and I cannot even search that. With this I can now search for the things that I want. Okay. Now this is in fact 
it's very similar to the source code of the program already. Now, of course, when you read this source code, uh, you might see that this is not really the C++ syntax that you have seen because this is not a true decompiler. It's just a string program that output the content of the exe file. All right. If you use a real decompiler like a Ghidra, it will show you. Uh, actually, it will show you the real command. Okay, I think this one no chance already. It's declared DOA. All right. So yeah, I cannot show you because somehow the Linux is uh, not working. But that one will show the real source code exactly like how you program in the C language. Now this one looks a bit different, but there are still things that we can read from here. For example, you see, hmm, what is this system call or something? So there might be some interesting information. All right. So until here, you should be able to know how to use this string to read the content of your exe file. Okay. Now, next thing. Uh, how do we actually read this file? Okay. Come back to here. Double click on Babel login. Do you notice anything strange? So this one is no because, like I said, it's not really a, a virus. Now, use static analysis to decompile Babel login and study the source code. So the first thing we want to do is, can you find the hidden flag? So what is this mean? Uh, is that actually, normally when people write program, they might put some information inside the source code. For example, when because attacker attacker is just like a developer it's just someone like you all right now when you write a program sometimes you might put your username or the password inside the source code for convenience or sometimes when you're testing a program you are a software tester you want to try whether the login work or not then you will put in your username and password in the source code another example is ip address normally when we write a network program in the source code, we write server IP is 192.168.1. something so that when the user run the program, the program can connect to the server. So what I want to tell you here is, in the source code, you can find many interesting things that the developer put inside for convenience or just that he forget, he is not careful, and then he put some, uh, some sensitive or important information could be username or password. Alright, so this is what we have here. Now, if you scan the file, you will notice that one in one of the line, you will see this THM not so hidden flag. So this one sounds like a flag. In fact, this is the answer for these questions. Okay, if you manage to find this line, just copy and paste it here, you will get the marks. So this is actually the hidden flag. Okay, now, I'm not actually hiding any virus here. I'm just hiding something for you to find here and there like treasure so that you, you get the idea of uh, how this thing works. All right. Okay, now the next question. Try to log in to Weber.exe. What is the username? So what we want to do now is we have this program, Weber.login.exe. I want to log in. So you see, I can try one by one. Maybe I try uh, cheese and pizza okay wrong username then cannot work okay so how do you actually find out what is the username and password now the clue that i give you is in fact the developer when he write this program he also put his username and password inside so one of the things that you see here is actually the username and password okay now of course if you ask me hey how do you know which is the username and password i cannot tell you because most of this analysis is, is trial and error. You have to try your luck and based on, based on experience, sometimes you get this faster. So uh, there is no handbook or any guide, step one, step two, that I can tell you and then say, okay, this is how you find the username. This is how you find the password. No, you will have to try one by one. Okay. In this challenge, I read line by line. Okay. And when I come to this line here, sim amnetic now. This one looks like a username. Could be, right? Could be. There is a chance that this is a username. So what you do is, you can go to this program, okay, the login.exe, and then you try this username. Huh. Now, the prompt is different. If the username is wrong, you will say wrong user and password. But now, this is how I guess this could be the correct username. The next thing I need is to find out what is the password. So it's very common that... Uh, 
every time we put in username, it's followed by password, correct? So I can guess that right after the line for this username, this is the username here, this could be the password. Alright, so only one way to find out. Let's try type this in to see whether we can log in or not. Okay, so now I will type. Wait, let me resize. Okay, let's type this in. Try hack me merge when. Press enter and yeah, access granted. Wow, so this is how I guess the username is synthetic. The password for this user is try hack me merge web. See now I log in already. Okay, now of course after this it doesn't do anything because this is just a simple test program for you to see that actually most of the time developer put this information inside. Alright, so you can actually recover many useful informations just by trying to see the source code of the program. So that is task three. Okay. Now, if you're okay, uh, we'll take. Now, let me finish task four. I finish task four, then we will take a very short break. So this is okay, right? Question time. Question time. Need to scan attendance. Yes. Uh, later I give to you attendance. Your command prompt in under sandbox here as well. Now, uh, in fact, I am not scared lah because this is not my PC. This. It's the lab PC, so if anything goes wrong, it's not my PC, I'm, I'm okay one. Okay, so task 3, clear? You have to understand uh, this is how people actually do static analysis. Then we go to task 4. Now from task 4 onwards, we change the directions a bit. So before this, we are trying to see what is virus, what is malware, how do we detect, how do we analyze, okay? That is a blue team. From task 4 onwards, we are red team. We want to see how we hide password because we already know uh, virus is e easily detected by antivirus. Intrusion is always captured by firewall or IDS, right? So as an attacker, if I want to build a virus to attack a host, what is the best way? for me to hide this thing so that it is not easily detected. Okay, so in task 4, this is also similar from your lab 3. So if you have done lab 3, I think this is uh, very simple now. And I want to show you the first way we can hide virus. Okay, now make this clear. I do not hide any virus. Anything that I show you here, none of this has real virus. Okay, just for educational purpose. Okay, now one common way to hide virus is to pack the virus file within a zip file. Okay, so you see, we can hide the virus inside a zip file. If a malicious executable file is packed in a zip, it becomes more difficult to be detected by the antivirus. This is mainly because of how antivirus uh, detect virus by doing a pattern matching. Okay. So, antivirus contain two components. Of course, the first one is the programming, the logic itself. This one is the scanner that will try to detect whether this is a virus or this is not a virus. Okay, And then you have a signature database. Now, this signature will contain all the virus signature file. Okay, now, how this work is, Okay, let me explain the concept first. Okay, now most virus can be easily detected, okay? Because uh you pay a lot of money, of course they should be able to detect. Most virus signature are stored as a hash value. So now you see this example here, okay? I have an exe file, this is called eCard.exe. So this is actually a virus. Is truly a virus but this virus is not harmful okay so if you double click and run this file uh, don't be panic nothing bad is going to happen okay now every uh, exe file or any file has a signature so let's say this is a signature for this ecar.exe 
So the signature is ASD123190 ASD FF8. Okay, now this one is very similar to the hash value that we learned earlier. And antivirus store virus signature as a hash value as well. We call them signature. Alright. So on the right, this is a signature database. And this one here are all the signature for some common virus that people already found out. Okay, so what it means is that if a file here, this file here, I see your signature is here, contained within the database, then I match. If this signature of the file matches any virus definition, that is how antivirus know that this is a virus, and then he will send a warning, oh wait, 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 detected virus, delete it, because it matches this one. This one and this one is the same. Now of course, as you can guess, if I have a virus file and this signature is not inside here, okay, then it will just bypass the detection. Nobody is going to know that this is in fact a virus. Okay, which is why sometimes antivirus is kind of uh, hit and miss. Up. 90 time, 90% 90 of the time it will detect, 10% of the time it will not detect because the virus signature is not here. And that's why you should always update your antivirus because when you update, they're actually adding new signature to this database so that you can detect more and more new variants of virus and some zero-day attacks. Alright? Okay, now, so, attacker is very smart. Attacker know that if I write a virus file, very soon, the antivirus will have my signature. This is very fast. That's why I suspect the virus, the guy who code the virus is also the guy who code the antivirus because very fast, in just a few minutes, a new virus, the signature will appear here. Then you can detect. Then they say, my antivirus is the best because I can detect all the reason attack faster than other people. Now you know why. Okay, so yeah, this one here uh, is always appear very quick. Now as an attacker, you want this to be uh, non-detectable, untraceable as possible, right? So the way you do this is, if I send this virus directly, very fast this will be flat. Then this is removed. So I will try my best to hide this thing. And one of the best way to hide is by hiding this thing into a zip file. So what the attacker do here is I take this ecar.dxd, which is a virus file, I zip this thing. I zip it. Then I get ecar.zip. So this is the new virus file. And it's just in fact a normal zip file. And inside this zip file, the content is a virus file, okay? But as we change this file from ecar.exe.ecar.zip, the signature also change, okay? So originally, the first virus file has the signature ASD something something FF8. Now, it is 99 ASL something something ASD. So what we gain from here is, first, we change the signature file. Now, the reason we do this is, the theory is, as we hide the virus inside a zip file, it becomes more difficult to be detected. Because now, if the antivirus want to detect this virus file, this virus file, which is hidden in a zip file, he will first have to unpack or unzip this file. Only he can check this one. So, there's one extra step involved. Which, so, this is why we say that as you hide, it becomes more and more invisible and more difficult to be traced. Now, in this example here, I have a new signature, 99 something something ESD. As I check in the database of the antivirus, the second line still has my signature. So in fact, I'm still detected. All right. So what happened here is the attacker tried to hide the original virus, ecar.exe, as a zip file to try to like uh, prevent detections, but somehow it is still detected. Now, this is true because antivirus is also smart. I know what attacker is going to pack the virus in a zip file. So when I scan any zip file, I need to unpack and scan because most of the time it could be a virus hiding inside. Okay, now, of course, the attacker is also uh, very smart. What they do now, see, first, I add to a zip file. Okay, you detect me. Fine, I do it again. Now I will hide the zip file 
which contain the virus, right? Here I have the virus inside into another zip. So what I'm doing here is I'm zipping the zip file that contain the virus. Okay, so it's like a nested zip now. And hopefully by doing so, it is now even more difficult to detect because now the antivirus have to unpack two layers to see the, the virus that is actually hiding inside. And now if you really see this example here, I have a new signature, XXA something 12D. And if we read line by line here, in fact, this signature is not in this signature database. So with this one, I managed to bypass the detection. Nobody's going to know that I'm actually hiding a virus, harboring a virus inside the zip file. Okay. Now, of course, as I show you later, most modern antivirus will still detect because they are even smarter now. I know you're going to pack two times, so I will just unpack two times. So uh, what you'll see later is as you go on, you can keep on packing and packing and packing. So a virus in the zip, between another zip, and then another zip, and another zip, and then so on, right? And as you do so, it will become more and more difficult to be detected. All right? So yeah, that is the idea of hiding a virus inside a zip file. So how it actually works? Yeah, so you see, uh, I have, if you trust me, okay, just now if you trust me, you download the folder here, you should have all the three files already given to you. So now I'm chapter three, task four. Okay, now again, uh, if you do not turn off your protections, then you cannot and extract because your machines will delete the file automatically. Okay, don't use protection so that you can learn how virus work. Okay, that advice only apply to cyber security. So now I have a folder and now I have three virus files. So as you can see here, what I have is this one. Okay, is like what I show you. I take this file and then I add to a zip file, something like this. I add this. I copy first and uh, so testing okay this one no need to do uh, let me just show you so I have this one here I add to archive all right then becomes it then I take this one uh, now you cannot do this like this you need to use another program and then you add to another archive so for example I open bin raw Put this inside, then it becomes ika2.zip. So this is the meaning of this three file. Okay, this is the original virus. This one is zip one time. This one is zip two times. Okay. Now, what we want to do for this challenge is we want to try to scan this file to see whether they are virus or not. Okay. Now, go to try hack me. You will get a link to virus total. Okay. What is virus total? Now, this is not a sponsored video. I'm not trying to sell you this video is sponsored by virus total. No, uh, it's because this virus total is the mother of all antivirus. Okay, now let me explain. Uh, some of you here might be using McAfee or Kaspersky or Window Defender. Okay, which is better? I don't know. But this is a collection of all antivirus. Means that all the best antivirus out there there's an online version of them. He compiled this, and every time I scan a virus, this virus total, like I say, mother of all antivirus, will scan that virus with every kind of antivirus out there. Okay, so this one is the best antivirus because it's like the avenger of antivirus. Okay, so you see what I do? I just drag and drop. Take this file, first one, let's try with the first one. Put it here, and then you will see, now oh, this is being detected. Okay, so you see uh, now, I have 56 antivirus detected that this is a virus out of 63. So it's quite a lot, like almost antivirus manage to detect this is actually a virus, which is not cool. As an as a attacker, we want this to be as non-detectable as possible, right? Okay, now, so as the output here you read, uh, red color, red color means detected as virus. Green color means cannot detect. Okay, so here you can see most of the antivirus like AdAware, Alibaba, mostly they detect this as a virus. Now to clear up some confusions here, um, they sometimes they say not a virus, not a virus. So this one is just uh, like I said, 
this eCar.com is not really a virus. It's a test virus for us to learn about cybersecurity. So this antivirus is so smart that they know this is not a real virus, but they still flag it at red, at red color because it has the property of a virus. But they know that this is not a virus, so they don't want to spread panic. They tell you this is not a virus. Okay, so the bottom line here is red color means detected as virus, green color means cannot detect. Okay, so you see 56 is quite a lot, right? Now, if I take the second file, I zip the virus one time, you see now only 51 can detect. So it's less already, but it's still quite a lot of antivirus can still catch you. Okay, now then you zip two times. Let's see. Only 49 can detect. So you see the number is decreasing now. The number of antivirus can know you are a virus is less and less. So as you do this and do this, keep on doing this, and this number is keep going, is going to keep to go down and then finally, I mean you cannot have 100% non-detectable but you will get less likely to be detected as you hide your virus uh, in many many nested zips. Alright, so that is the first concept that I want to show you today about how to hide virus in a zip file. Okay. Alright now, question time. Okay, before that I have one challenge for you. Lah. Something that you might want to try. So we know this is a virus file. Actually, you see ah, if I open my Gmail, I try to send this to, to Dr. Gun because next week he wants to teach you. If I infect his computer down, maybe he cannot teach you next week. Let's see how he solved this. But anyway, cannot send one, you see ah, because Google is so smart, like when I want to send a zip file or a virus file, they will stop it. So for example here, I have, this is uh, Gmail. So I try to drag this file into Gmail as an attachment. See very soon, you will say virus detected. So cannot send one. Even if I zip, you see Google will still detect. Of course, that is Google, ma, right or not? Now, I zip two times. Google also detect. So my challenge to you now is, can you find a way to send this file without being detected by Google? Alright, now this one I will not cover how. If you can do this, that just means you are very talented. Okay, but this is a bonus. Uh, if you want to try this, you can, but it's optional. Alright? Okay, now, uh, I think this today we cannot take break. I hope it's okay. We have four more to go. Let me finish this and then you take a longer break for the whole day. Okay, any questions? Why can't the antivirus, why can't the virus attack the antivirus when the AV read the virus file? Kong, so can Nerf give us a very good idea? So, Antivirus is there to detect virus. Why not the why not the virus just kill the antivirus, and then it can do everything. In fact, it is possible, which is why uh in the next lecture I will show you that what happened when your firewall is being attacked. All right, it's actually possible, but yeah, good good idea there. Three to six got class. Just using the link, not sending the file. Yeah, this is so smart. In fact, that is how I do it. Alright, now guys, we go to task 5 and I will now show you a new technique. This is called... Okay, this one is so hard to read. Let me try to read this right. Steganography. Steganography. Read it like French so that it sounds more uh, atas. Steganography, right? Okay, now this one here uh, is another very popular way for attacker to hide virus using uh, we call this embedding technique okay now I want to make this clear I'm not hiding any virus here in fact I'm just hiding text file but you can think of this like similarly if this works the hacker can use this to hide virus okay so the idea of uh, steganography is that many popular files that we use this day and then we send and receive for example your text file your document file your PDF file 
which is what I share, your lecture note as uh, image file and most of the GIF file that we share as our meme. Yeah, in fact, we can hide secret data inside. Do you know that before I tell you? Yeah, so now I show you how to do that. Uh, and that is how attacker hide things. Because you see, uh, uh, to our common eye, a picture is just a picture. If you send me a JPEG file, I'm just going to open the file and see what you send me. Okay, of course, uh, we won't go and suspect, right? Wait, why this guy send me a file? Could there be a virus or anything? Not and no people will go and think in that way, right? Because of this, hacker like to hide file inside another file. So this is how it works. Um, okay, now this one here is hiding a data inside image. So what it means is inside a picture, you can hide a text file in that picture. So a picture is not just a picture anymore. A picture is an image file with a text file. Or inside an image file, you can hide a virus inside. So every time you see the picture, open and double click. Wow, pretty good. Double click immediately. Then you are infected by virus. So this is what we call steganography. Okay? I'll show you two examples. First example is using image. Second example is using an audio file. So you have to understand the concept first. Okay, now uh, we call this data and virus can be obfuscated inside an image file. Obfuscate means that hide, all right? When a virus is hidden in an image file, the antivirus is not likely to pick up the virus signature since the hash for virus is different from the hash for virus class image. So you see, uh, the, the point here is that if I just send the virus as the virus, most likely the signature is already in the database. But if I send the virus inside an image, normally the antivirus will not have the signature of the image because image is not a virus, right? So this is how you hide. Okay, users are also less suspicious because since image like JPEG, PNG, TIFF, and GIF are quite commonly shared, yeah, it's true. Like now if you send me a picture, hey sir, why I cannot run the command? Then of course I will double click one. Everyone do that. Everyone is guilty. So when the user open the image, the Trojan or the virus hidden inside will be side loaded. Means that as you are reading the file or as you are viewing the image, the virus also execute itself. Okay? So data can be hidden and extracted into image using this tool we call a stack hide, steganography hide. Okay? Now this is a very good tool that I think everyone should know. Especially for us after cybersecurity class, we don't simply send anything. Everything that we want to post on Utah Confession, we use Caesar Cypher to shift by a few characters. Anything that you want to share, you hide inside an image file. Okay, sometimes this is a bit extra, lah, but it's cool that we can do that. Okay, now, so there are two processes. Okay, first one is to hide something. Second one is to extract the secret. Okay, I will show you both. Now, to first is to hide. So you see, uh, to hide is like this. You have a cover file. We call this a cover file. It's like you, this is a covert mission and then you have something to hide. So this is the file that we send and receive. This is the normal file, the image, for example, all right, that everyone can see. And then you have embed file. Now this is the secret, okay? It can be a text file or like you say, image within an image also can. This can be an exe file as well, anything. But it's a secret that only people that know the secret know. For example, now if I give you an image file, if we both know that there is a secret inside, then we will try and unhide the secret. But for any other people, they will just think this is a normal image. All right. So what you do is you take this thing, you put this inside the cover file. Okay. And you need one more thing, which is the passphrase. So this one is like a password. To protect this file so in the end anyone can get this picture but only the guy who know the passphrase can extract the secret okay so you see your cover file is the picture now inside is hidden with an embed file so this is your secret that we are trying to hide okay
Now, the cover file, oops, the syntax is SRCF, as we'll see later. Okay, see here, my mouse cursor. The embed file is called EF. So we need three things. The cover file, the file that you want to hide, and the password. Alright, now similarly for extractions. So this is again, uh, you want to hide. Now, I have an image file with a secret inside. Okay, I want to take this thing out. So I have to extract using a passphrase of course, the password that is used to lock the file or hide the file. And then I get two things, the original image and the secret. So in this case, the original image is called the secret file and the hidden hidden message is called the embed file. Alright? Now, as you can see here, the command to do this is so simple. I mean, this technique is really cool, but to do this is so easy. See, I only use stack hide, embed. If you want to hide, use embed keyword. And then here, cf, the option, to specify the cover file and EF to specify the embed file. This is the secret that we want to hide inside this cover file. Now to extract is also very easy. Use the syntax extract. SF, so this is the file that we receive. All right, secret file, output to a text file or anything. So this is the file that people hide. So it's really easy, right? Now let me show you a demo on how this actually works. All right, so we go back to try hack me now. Okay, we are in task five already. Open your the folder that I give to you, task five. Now we go to task five. So you will see three folders here. Okay, wait, uh, let me make this bigger for you. Okay, three folders. Now, the first example I want to show is how to get secret out from a picture and then I show you how to hide a secret inside a picture, alright? So, we will first do this one. Look at the image dualimao.jpg. Okay, you know that there is a hidden file inside. Your job now is to extract the secret. Alright, so this folder here, unhide, inside got two pictures. Okay, we start with the first one, Dua Lima. So, I tell you, there's a secret. What is the secret? First thing people will do is double click. Now, if you double click, in fact, there's no, nothing really here except you really see there's two lines here. So, Dua Lima, two lines here. Nothing special, right? But, inside this picture, little we know that there is a secret inside. So, how we do this is you can now use stack height to so open your command prompt, okay? This is my command prompt. This is the folder that I give to you. All right, now the tool stack hack is given here in this folder. So you will need to go to this folder and then you look for this program stack hack. Now, do not run this program, okay? Just drag and drop this thing into your command prompt. See, now it shows the program path, okay? Space bar. Now, I go back up one folder and go back into the unhide folder where I have the dual lima picture here. Okay, so the command here I have to type extract because now I want to steal the secret up from the picture. Okay, the first syntax is sf the secret file the picture with hidden message. I now drag and drop this picture here. Okay, spacebar dash xf. Now this one is the output you have to save the secret uh, to a file. So for example, let's say, we assume that I know this is a text file, a text. So normally, now of course you don't have to do this, but to make this simple to understand for everyone, I will now first create, a, uh, let's say, Dua Limao Secret, okay? So this one here is a text file, currently it's empty, and this is where I'm going to store the secret that I uncover later. Alright, so I will now take this file, I drag and drop to the command prompt. So you see, uh, SF here, you specify the picture that we know that is a hidden thing inside. 
xf here, you specify the output file. So in this case, is a text file. Alright, then you press enter. Enter passphrase. Okay, we need a password. So where is the password? Now normally, when people hide uh, things inside the image or anything, we like to hide the passphrase as a meta. Yeah, meta. So meta actually means site attributes. So over here, if you right click on this picture, go to properties. Now this is where you can find the passphrase. I hide the passphrase in details. Go to details, then you can see. Wait a minute, why got so many things here? So you see, smart that you read this. Smart that you read this. In the comment, now see the comment sections. That is a hidden flag. Okay, if this is too small, let me copy this out for you on a notepad file. Wow, that is a comment here. So this is how people normally hide the secret because we like to hide as a meta, right? So the passphrase. So there's a hidden flag inside this image. The passphrase is the name of the camera used to take this picture in one word. So as a picture, image file, the meta will also contain the type of camera that's used to take the picture. In fact, you have so many things like geolocations, when you take this picture, uh, what is the format of this picture, what is the uh, moments, the area. Okay. Now, one of the things is the camera model. So if you go down, then you see here is the camera model. In fact, this picture is taken using iPhone 14. I'm doing this so that next trimester I don't have to repeat the class again. Next same iPhone 14 will be out. Okay, so iPhone 14 is the passphrase. This is how I know. So I come back here, I type iPhone 14. Press Y and that, when you see this, it means the secret is already out. You already extract. Okay, trust me, now I see this file, double click, I get the flag. So the flag is in fact, meet me in Wakanda. Now if you see this, just have to copy paste this thing into Trihang Me, you will get the marks. Alright, so yeah, I hope you can see the idea here. This is kind of cool because that is how normally people hide uh, data inside another data. So you can hide image in an image, text in an image, a program in an image, so many kind of things you can do. But of course, where you get the passphrase is there are many ways. Lah. One of the way people like to hide is hiding the, the hint or the clue in the metadata of the picture. Alright, so what happens if you run the program? This is just a picture, nothing inside. Can just run it, okay? Normal hacker put in passphrase or not? Actually, yeah, some people did that. Uh, but why it is still safe? Because like I said, normal people like you and me, be honest, like how many of you before open any picture, Go and check like that one. How many of you do that? I don't think any one of us do that, right? Okay, so yeah, that is why we can do that. But of course, there are better ways to hide this passphrase. If you ask me, there are actually better ways. Now, same thing. Second example. I repeat this for the next picture, alright? Okay. Now, look at the image PlayStation 5. So this is every guy dream. But right now, uh, PlayStation is like 3K on Lazada. It's not a good time to buy a PlayStation yet, but assuming that Christmas comes early and then you get a PlayStation 5. Now, anyone who are familiar with PlayStation knows that if you want to play online with other players using PlayStation, you need to have a PlayStation Network account. We call this the PSN account. Okay, have to pay money one like one year, hundred something. Then you get to get online and play with other players. Alright, so in this picture, double click, it's just a very beautiful picture of PlayStation 5. Now, what is hidden inside here is actually a user account of PSN. So, our job now is, can you try to use Stack Hype? Try to uncover the secret and then tell me what is the username and password that I can use to log into the PlayStation Network. And the clue is, it is already hidden in this picture. Okay, now I'll show you very quickly how I solve this because we have done this. Huh? So first, I will create a text file, maybe I say ps5 account, 
all right then i will use stack height as usual now you have to go here find the program pull to command prompt spacebar go to stack height come back to this and now this time you want to extract the cover file cf is this playstation 5 picture spacebar xf is the output as a text file put it here all right now hey okay. what did i do wrong oh sorry it's i put the wrong syntax it should be sf okay, okay let me do this again cf is used to hide okay hold on huh? okay let me do this again so dash extract sf so this is the secret file the picture here xf is the output here press enter okay now passphrase so again you can do something similar check whether anything in the metadata so in fact yeah that is is the same so here we go again sony the passphrase is the name of the company who made playstation 5 no caps so who made playstation 5 i think all the play all the gamer here know lah because it's our dream that we always look at things that we cannot afford to buy so you know this is sony right sony made playstation so the keyword here is sony press y and in a while you can see now i recover the secret message hidden inside here okay now with this info you can go and finish up the rest but anyway there is uh, some problem here in try me on try me i set the password as tf board without 2022 la. so just a head up this one here uh you when you write the answer don't write 2022 i did i said wrongly here okay so yeah that is how you get something from a picture microsoft i think this guy download his playstation 5 from microsoft app store so uh, again as you can hide i mean you can actually you can also hide okay now i think i don't have enough time to show you how i hide so i will skip the part because mostly uh, <clears throat> in most of the challenge you are supposed to find a secret not to hide a secret so i will not show you how to uh, hide in this stream we move on to task 6 okay now task 6 is very similar but now it's not image it's an audio file so like i said earlier this can work on most of the popular file format that we are working with which is why it's a very good technique because no people will be really suspicious about something that's hidden on the thing that we have been using day in and day out right so here surprise surprise if you are guilty of downloading free mp3 there's a high chance that your pc is already infected yeah it's true how many of you still download mp3 why not use spotify family five people i think if you share one people pay about two ringgit three ringgit unless no people want to share with you don't download free mp3 because nothing can be free if the mp3 is free means they are hiding something okay so now i want to show you this is actually true that i can hide a text file inside an audio file so in task the next task here task number six you have an audio file okay so this name gossip so well, when i see this name uh, my first reaction is i want to play this file i want to see who is the gossip about right or not so yeah if you download and then you play let me download here i cannot download i cannot play on this remote machine because this machine is in the lab later the lab of officer thing today is still halloween so i download on my real pc let me try to download the file <clears throat> okay you have to play the file now this this class is not really uh, there's not many theory because i'm just trying to show you like what are the common thing that people do in kind of malware analysis how to hide thing here and there okay so yeah I have downloaded the file if i play the file it's an audio file ok 
case look something like this so this file here okay let's Okay. It's a link to this file. Do you find any secret? So normally, uh, it's not that easy. What happens is, okay, we already know right, because I tell you that there's a hidden file, but if I give this file to any other people, I tell them to find secret, what they will do is just play the file and then try to hear is there any, uh, any clue that you can hear from the audio file, but in fact, no. So, uh, huh, really, yeah. Uh, Music is so loud, man. I never edit anything. This one is to wake you up. <clears throat> okay, so now let's let's try to find the secret. Okay, we're going to use the same tool. <laughs> this show that... Really, man? Why when I speak, you say it's too soft and then now you say it's too loud? It's not my fault, okay? I'm not the singer. Blame Dua Lipa, don't blame me. Alright. Okay, now the past phrase is the song name. So, if you're not a fan of Dua, then you might not know what is the song name. I already give you the hint here. It's physical. So, this is the past phrase. Now, I'll show you very quickly how I can unhide. So, it's very similar with how we unhide for an image. In fact, it's the same way. Okay. Now clear. Go to stack height, drag and drop this thing. Spacebar, SF to specify the secret file. Now this time is an audio file. It's not an image file, but again it will still work. Okay, XF. Now output we can just create a text file here. For example, secret. Txt. Okay. Then just drag and drop this thing here. Press enter. Oh, I forget to type the common extract. Wait, uh, sorry, la, I do not know it's so loud. Ma. From here, it's okay. Ma. Okay, then past phrase is physical, as you can find from the hit. Okay, alright. Then you get the secret here. You have a line of secret that I put it here to give you a heads up, assignment is coming. In fact, very soon, right after this class, you get your assignment. Okay, now you can just copy and paste this whole thing into Try Hack Me, then you get full marks for this task. All right, so with this, I finish up steganography. I will now do uh, seven and eight, very fast. Okay, this is very fast. Okay, now we go to task seven. We can also hide a virus in a word document. Now, I want to show this is because uh, if you think about it, you want to hide a virus, you should hide a virus in a file that is most popular because more people download the file, more people will get infected, right? That's why word document is actually a PDF, word and PDF. This two is the most popular target, the file format that attacker use because as you can guess, most of the files that we exchange are PDF and Word document. All right. So here in task seven, I'm going to show you how you can actually hide some data inside a Word document. Now, of course, uh, this is not a, a very good example. It's just as a demo. Okay. Now you go to task seven. There's a Word file called I am here. So open this file. Okay, now enable anything. When you click this, this is where the virus infect you. Okay, now what I'm trying to show is we can hide data inside a Word document. The real way people do this is by something we call a uh, word scripting. You have to be able to write macro in a Word and Excel and in fact any other Microsoft Office tool. This is called macro scripting. All right. Now. In cybersecurity course, I will not go into macro scripting because that will take us two hours just for that. So I'm just going to show you a very simple example here. I have a simple text file. So the clue here is that is a hidden flag inside. Okay, I give you one minute 
can anyone here try to find where is the flag? Where did I hide the flag? There is a flag here. So you find it. Well, I think I scared people away. 20 people already quit. <laughs> Alright, so you can read the hint here. Read the hint. Okay. What is a good way for camouflage? So you try to think, yeah, this is what I normally do to add the word count for my assignment. Because my lecturer say minimum word count is 5,000. I only write 2,000. So I write, I put a lot of white space and A. And then I put all into white color. Then no one can see that there is a hidden message here. Okay, so this is the clue here. Now in this example, I hide the clue in the text box. So in Microsoft Word, I can do something like this. I draw a text, draw a box, okay? And then I can right click, go to format shape. This is where I can hide some message here. This is quite common also. Then you change this thing to white color. So just change this thing to white. Format auto shape color and line change to white then you will not know there's a box so in fact this is the trick that the attacker used for this challenge now as you can see this is a very trivial example this is very simple so uh nothing to be proud about lah. but yeah anyway this works so the way i solve this challenge is you have to do control a then you start say a there are many box here this look weird so let's check this out okay now in fact you click on them you can you have to try a bit lah, because then you need to be able to get the box, go to format shapes, go to alternate text, then you will see whether the flag is here. So I try one and then it says it's not here. So we know we are in the right track, but this is not the right box. So let's try again. Maybe I have one more box here, this box. Okay. I can do format shapes, alternate text, not here. So it's okay, fine. Because anyway, malware analysis is about try and error. So I keep trying and you will notice here. At the top left corner, there's one very, very small one. And this is in fact where I hide the flag, right? Now, this one is a bit hard to click because it's actually in the header section. So you might sometimes get, you might accidentally click the header. So you have to try a few times until you finally click this. And then here, this is the flag. The flag is you are beautiful in white. So for the people who get this, can copy this, paste into try hack me, you get all the marks, all right? Now, uh, if you think this is a bit hard, you can always zoom in. If you zoom in, then it should be easier for you to click this thing. Uh, all right. Now, that is a very trivial example to show that there is, in fact, people hiding things on our document. Okay. But I want to make this clear. The real hacker don't do this. Hey, this is like a keto level. A real hacker will use macro scripting. All right. Last example for today. And then we go. I just need five more minutes. Give me five more minutes. Okay, now the last example is uh, quite important. Is I want to teach you how to fix a file. Okay, now let's go to the last example here. We have task 8 repair a word document. So, very fast one, five minutes only. Now, uh, all the examples that we have done so far, so far are uh, from task 3 until task 8. It's very lucky. Like we never really find anything other than we need to know how to use the tool. Once we know the technique that's used to uh, hide the data, we can reverse engineer to get it back. It's really uh, straightforward uh, all the while. But in the real world, it's a bit different because sometimes the file that we want to analyze might be corrupted. So it's not always as lucky as you will get a file that just works straight out of the box. Okay, now in task 8, we have a file that we want to analyze. So we are suspecting that this could be a virus or something hidden inside. Now when we, I want to analyze this, this file is corrupted. So we need to learn how to repair the file before we can analyze. This is quite common in malware analysis. Alright, so over here you see, when I try to open this Word document, I cannot open because the file is corrupted. So this example here is because the header of the file is corrupted. 
So we need to use this program called WinHex. Okay, this one later you go and download and install this one uh, on your program, on your PC. Okay, I will just demo how it works. Now the theory for this part is every program, not not every program, every file that we have, including text file, image file, Excel file, PDF file, any file, in fact any file, right, has a fixed header. So if you look at this table here, this table shows us all the header of all different file formats. Now as we know, computer is just 1010. So when we store data is also 1010, but there are many representations. So normally in malware analysis, we like to represent a data in hexadecimal value. So all the value that you see here are in fact mostly hex value, but of course there are some that could be a decimal value or base 64 or something, but mostly it's hex value. Okay, so here, if I have a JPEG, every file format have own extension. So a JPEG will be .jpg, a Word document will be .doc, an Excel file will be .xls, right? So we know a few of these because they are common, we are com it's commonly used. Now, next you see here header. So it means that all these files have a fixed header. This one will not change, it's forever the same. So for example, let's say I have a PDF file, right? Uh, yeah, the header will always be something that looks like this. It's always the same. So if I have two files, let's say uh, a, a two picture, one picture is the profile picture of Aliang. Another picture is a profile picture of Hudson. Okay, and they are both in JPEG format. Now, although we know that both picture is showing us different, different face, but when we analyze that two file, we will see that they start with the same header, because if you are having the same file format, you will have the same file header. And with this, this is how uh people can detect what kind of files that you are dealing with. Okay, now, there are many, many different files. So it is not possible for us to remember all these headers. So to make life easy, we have this website called Check Header here. Okay, now you click on here. This is a, a website that I like to use to check for file signature. So for example, now, if I have a PDF file, I can just type PDF, just like Google, you search, and then he tell me PDF file will start with this header. Alright, now if I have an exe file, I can submit. No, exe file will always start with this header. So this is like the Google for file signature check. If you want to know what is the header for this certain file format, come here, type this here, you will get the hex value for the file format. Alright, so uh, you change to txt then can open. Yeah, that also work. Lah. Actually, that also work, but I'm trying to teach you how to solve this challenge. It just means you are smarter than average people. Okay, now for example here in our challenge, we have a document file. Okay, so this is a DOC file. If you want to be sure, you can go to properties and then you can check here. This is in fact a .doc file, as you can see here, right? Okay, so we want to know what is the extension of DOC. So I think this is the one, right? DOC, yeah, this one. It's a Microsoft Office document. So this one here, this is the header that I want. Now there are a few. So sometimes I will have to try one by one to get the right one. Okay. Next, I open WinHex. Now later as you install your... Wow, what is that? Why show me all the cute anime thing? Okay, now this is a very popular program that most malware analysis have. So if you have, uh, if you see anyone with this program, you know he is working in cybersecurity. Okay, now next, I just have to take this file. Okay, wait now, let me close this. Okay, drag and drop. Then this one will open up this thing. So now here you can see, wow, what are all these hacks where you cannot understand? Of course we cannot understand now, we are not computer. Okay, but don't worry, we are only here to fix the header. So over here, you can see that the first few bytes is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, now this is wrong already because uh, as you know, I know it's a bit small, uh, so let me see whether I can zoom in or not. 
I cannot zoom in. Never mind lah. I forget my presenter. I cannot zoom in. So anyway, uh, the what we have to show here, this header is wrong. It's corrupted because as we learn from the website, the header for Microsoft Word document should be this one. Okay. So what I do is I can now copy this value here to fix the corrupted file. So see now I will type. By changing the header here so I put this side by side so that you can see clearly what I'm doing all right I start from the very first bit because header always start from the first bit d0 so this is hex value this is one byte already huh? cf11 e0 b1 1a e1 so I fix the corrupted header now I just need to click save button to all right and save. See, once I do this, I go back to this file, I double click, I can now open the file because the file is fixed. Right? Now, for those who can open the file, you can actually see that, yeah, I put some message here. Cyber security is fun, right? Am I correct? If it is not, just act like it is, uh, give me some confidence to continue. Okay, we sugarcoat everything here. I hope you are still doing okay. I, re I really mean this. Uh, I hope everyone here is still okay. You deserve a flat value and this is the flat. Yeah, this is the answer. So copy this to try me to solve all the challenge for malware analysis. Okay. Now what I want to show you here is that again when we analyze for malware, sometimes the program could be corrupted. So we need to be able to use win hacks to fix the corrupted file before we can open the file and continue with our analysis. Alright? So yeah. That's everything that I want to show you today um, for attendance as usual. I scan for you. So see you again on Wednesday night and we will continue with the network security. So Wednesday uh, is the last class for my part and I hope you attend because that one is very important. There is a lot of theory that you need to understand. In fact, okay, I want to hard sell again. Okay, One question from FA is totally from chapter 4, Network Security. So I hope to see you again on Wednesday night. Until then, take care, have fun, continue hacking because hacking is fun, but do it for the right reason. Bye-bye.